Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Um, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Samuel Smith, or Sam Smith. I'm a research coordinator at Genomics England, um, and I work closely with uh, the GSIP community um, to help promote research uh, coming out of the data generated through the 100,000 Genomes Project. Um, I'll share my screen. Okay, yeah, thank you for joining us today. Um, our speakers today are uh, Shadi Basuni, who will be presenting on um, P53, uh, the value of P53 sequencing in prognostication of head and neck cancer venturing beyond the coding regions. Uh, and we also have uh, Professor Claude Schlala and Professor Louise Jones, who will be presenting on uh, dynamic biobanking for advancing breast cancer research. Um, some other things to note uh, during this seminar is that we also, we have just announced our Genomic Singular Research Summit 2023, which will be going ahead on the 19th of September. Um, we have three tracks uh, with different uh, topics for our speakers to talk on, and uh, we are now we have now opened um, abstract submissions. So if anyone here would like to present on any research that they've done on the data that Genomics England holds or working with collaboratively with Genomics England, um, please email those to events at Genomics England Code UK. You can also register for free using the QR code on the right. Um, our next research seminar will be the 25th of April. So far we have uh, Dr. Daniel Green uh, as an out speaker and uh, we haven't uh, lined up a second speaker yet, uh, but you can keep up to date with all of these um, notes and future seminars by following us on our Twitter handle at GSIP team. Okay, um, that's all I had to say. If anyone has any questions throughout the seminar, uh, please drop them in the Q&A feature at the bottom of the uh, panel in Zoom. Um, I'll be handing over to uh, Shadi Basuni to get started. Um, and we'll be recording this, so in case, in case anyone uh, misses the end of the seminar or wants to send it to anyone else, please check out our recordings on our YouTube channel. Okay. So Sam, is that all good with the screen? Just... Yeah, that looks good. Perfect. Okay, I'll give you the floor now, Shadi. Thank you. So yeah, thank you for the introduction. And it's a pleasure to be here on behalf of the Head and Neck GSIP to present about um, one area in particular of our work. Um, so there's been a, a bit of a journey with regards to the role of TP53 in the prognostication of head and neck cancer. Um, I want to go through some of the background and then highlight the work and where our work fits in in this and how we as a GSIP are planning to direct the future. So as a brief um, introduction to our GSIP, we're uh, perhaps compared to other GSIPs a smaller group, but nevertheless, we're made up of scientists and academic clinicians from all four corners of England. And we're led by Professor Terry Jones in Liverpool with Matt Lechner and Liam Masterson being co-leads. So in addition to exploratory work, our strong clinical integration has been able to really focus our aims into um, trying to get our patients access to the benefits of genomic technology as soon as possible. Um, so in this talk, I'm only going to talk about one type of head and neck cancer, which is head and neck squamous cell carcinoma, and that in itself can be subdivided into um, the oral cavity, which is different to the oropharynx, and commonly that causes some confusion, and then the nasopharynx, as well as the larynx and the hyperpharynx. Despite the 100,000 Genomes Project giving us over 370 samples, for the purpose of uh, prognostication and looking at clinical data, we decided to use a cohort of 160 that we were absolutely certain about the clinical um, and outcome data for. So as a bit of background, this is a challenging disease to manage in a desperately intimate part of the body. It's the sixth most common cancer worldwide, but in the UK, it's now the fourth most common cancer in men, and we see around 12,500 cases per year. The incidence is increasing at an alarming rate, in particular compared to other solid tumors, and oral cancer, for example, has increased by 50% every decade. Um, 
Tobacco and alcohol remain the most causative agent with notable synergistic effect, but certain populations have other important etiological factors, such as pan or beta nut chewing in certain Asian populations. We also know that viral infection play an important role, but only in certain subtypes, and namely HPV is important in oropharynx and EBV is important in the nasopharynx. So as you can already start to see, there's a heterogeneity between the different subtypes. However, when pulled together, overall the survival is static and any modest improvement is attributed to HPV positive disease in the oropharynx, which tend to do better. But importantly, survivors face a significant quality of life issue with far reaching functional impact and disfigurement. And the, the sort of all the different modalities of treatment contribute towards this. So for example, if we take this case of oral cancer, the resection and subsequent reconstruction inevitably impact speech and swallow, but then there's a decision as to whether this patient needs adjuvant chemo and radiotherapy, which can further impact swallow. So we know that 20% of patients who um, have chemo radiotherapy require long-term or permanent PEG feeding. So our ability to justify intensification or deintensification is not only important, but relies on prognostic biomarkers. Currently, HPV status is the only reliable biomarker, and this means it's restricted to the oropharynx. So patient groups um, and their input has been clear and consistent. The Liverpool PPI group have highlighted that the absence of a prognostic biomarker at time of diagnosis is a critical weakness in our current care and they want research to focus on enabling us to make better joint decisions on their best treatment options. This call for personalized decision-making was also echoed by the James Lind Alliance. And that's where the potential role of P53 as a biomarker sort of comes in. And this has been an interest in the head and neck community for a long time. So we all know the importance of P53 protein it plays critical roles in cell cycle control and apoptosis in response to DNA damage and other cellular stresses. And if we look at the TP53 gene that encodes that protein, it's the most commonly mutated gene in human cancer. It's located on the short arm of chromosome 17, and it's composed of around 20 kilobases. So as you can see, there's a total of 14 exons, exon one being non-coding, followed by 10 exons that um, code for the full length P53 protein, as well as three alternative exons involved in isomers um, of the protein. Importantly, intron one separates exon one from the coding sequence, and it's a highly conserved uh, region of around 10 kilobases. Um, so the clinical significance of TP53 appears to be, well, we know is dependent on tumor, not only tumor subtype, but also context. So drawing from breast cancer, uh, as a sort of hats off to the next uh, two professors talking, we know that uh, TP53 mutation um, is associated with poor survival in ER positive patients, but the same thing is not seen in ER negative patients. And some studies have demonstrated that mutations are linked to poor prognosis in breast cancer treated with hormone therapy, but not with chemotherapy where it's seen actually to improve prognosis. So the, it being tumor and context specific means you cannot extrapolate the findings to other tumor types. And then the hypothesis that TP53 disruption will confer some prognostic value is particularly of interest in the head and neck because we know that loss of P53 function occurs in high frequency. So when we look at the significantly mutated genes in our gel 160 cohort, you can see that TP53 is the most commonly mutated gene at around 66%. And just something to highlight is you can see here that the HPV positive disease, which are all um, oropharyngeal cancer, don't have any TP53 mutation. <clears throat> So there's been a lot of interest in this for a long time, and uh, multiple studies have demonstrated a link between mutation and survival. However, previous meta-analysis demonstrated that when the results are pooled, 
um, the results are actually inconclusive. And there are several reasons why that might be, but it was felt that one of them might be uh, the marker test for looking for TP53 mutation. And traditionally, immunohistochemical staining was used as a surrogate marker for mutational status. And that's because wild type P53 is inherently unstable and induces its own degradation through the upregulation of MDM2. On the other hand, cells harboring missense mutations, MDM2 is no longer uh, induced, therefore that negative feedback in loop is broken, and this persistence of P53 protein is then able to be picked up in the cells through immunohistochemistry. However, we know that that misses an important group of mutations um, where some cohorts up to 20% of mutations are truncating mutations that therefore lead to a loss of protein expression and therefore also absence and staining. So despite there being a mutation, uh, immunohistochemistry will not be able to differentiate that from um, wild type P50, TP53. And we felt that sequencing can overcome these limitations. And then our colleagues with the TCGA data demonstrated with a nice cohort of 503 samples that in fact um, mutated TP53 is associated with worse survival. And then in 2018, the National Test Directory came about and that um, included TP53 as one of only a small number of targets available for head and neck squamous cell carcinoma available for testing on the NHS. The problem is, is that we have no rationale or evidence to support its integration into clinical practice and unpublished data from one of the genomic laboratory hubs showed that there were no requests for these tests to be done on head and neck squamous cell carcinoma in 2022. So we therefore felt it was time to revisit the question and we carried out a systematic review and meta-analysis only including papers that carried out TP53 sequencing. So the outcome data, we were able to collate 15 studies of the included studies into the meta-analysis and this indicated a survival advantage in, but in all overall disease-free and disease-specific for wild-type TP53. Our project, our paper did, however, highlight the difficulties encountered when attempting to, to determine outcome based on retrospective data, um, as many of the studies presented a combined analysis of all the different subtypes, and it was difficult for us to pull out a specific subsite contribution. And there was also inconsistency with accounting for HPV. Furthermore, our qualitative assessment of each study demonstrated global room for improvement and calls for a prospective study. Another aspect that the systematic review highlighted was potential sequencing bias. Initial work on the TP53 gene reported that somatic mutations were clustered over 1,200 bases conserved in the regions of exon five to eight. So most studies in our systematic review only sequence these regions. So now in the era of next generation sequencing, uh, we thought we can start to think beyond the hotspot as whole exome and whole genome sequencing offers us a less biased approach. So we wanted to explore TP53 mutation in our gel 160 cohort, but first we wanted to demonstrate to ourselves that the 160 was an actual representative sample and thus should have the similar mutational picture of the TCA data. And when you look at the common driver mutations, you can see that they match up well. We then went on to look at the association of TP53 with survival in our cohort and a similar result as what was found with TCGA, uh, TP53 mutation is associated with worse survival. And then we started thinking about thinking beyond the hotspot and what that actually meant. Um, and both whole genome and whole exome sequencing showed us that uh, around 25% of mutations occur outside of this uh, five to eight exon hotspot. And of particular note, 5% uh, of mutations occur in the oligomerization domain found on exons nine and 10. 
And the vast majority of these uh, mutations were nonsense mutations with likely deleterious effects. So we started thinking that when, when we're going beyond the hotspot and in particular trying to look for clinical utility, the focus should be more on the impact of the mutation on protein function. And there have been a few classification algorithms uh, trying to look at uh, classifying mutations based on protein function. And what we used was essentially a disruptive mutation was a truncation or any mutation that affected the L2, L3 region of the DNA binding domain. So then when we took this back to our GEL160 cohort and classified the TP53 mutations as per those classification, you can see nicely that the non-disruptive mutation separates away um, and is actually not significantly different to wild type, whereas those that were deemed to have a deleterious effect on the protein um, are significantly different. Um, <clears throat> and then we were able to, and this is a sort of early uh, figure, but we're able to plot uh, the mutations based on where the protein is. And as you can see, the majority are affecting the DNA binding domain or the uh, aspects of the protein that are important for the tetramer structure. Um, but then we then started thinking, well, uh, we've thought beyond the hotspots and can we delve a bit deeper and think, is there any benefit to think beyond the coding region? In particular, given that uh, the data in gel offers us that advantage over um, other whole exome sequencing. So we know that 2% of mutations, oh, we know that 2% of mutations occur at the intron exon boundaries. Um, and this obviously affects splicing donor and acceptor sites. However, um, there's been a lot of work to show that significant somatic variations also occur at deeper sites in the introns, which are not covered by many conventional or exome sequencing. So again, we know that in, uh, well, there's sort of published work that in breast cancer, uh, mutation, mutations in intron line can have an impact on alternative, uh, alternative exons with a subsequent impact on the oligomerization domain. And then these are some of the published data that show that um, intronic mutations can have a, uh, an impact on uh, the function of the protein. And of particular interest to us, there was uh, some published work that showed that um, intronic point mutations occur at a high frequency in certain subtypes of head and neck cancer. So we then went to interrogate our gel cohort to say, is there a benefit to thinking beyond the coding region? And uh, we did uh, find a small subset that appeared to have uh, worse outcomes with coding in uh, with sort of mutations in non-coding region. Of course, these numbers are way too small to draw any conclusions. However, uh, made us think, and it favors an unbiased approach that analyzes both introns and exons. So bringing it all together, um, our systematic review provided clarity and assurance of a survival impact of TP53 mutation when detected by direct sequencing. However, it does also highlight the need for a robust and unbiased approach to assessing the effectiveness of this sequencing. Overall, our review highlighted that the main limitation was pooled analysis of all the different anatomical subsites and HPV status that we felt erodes the validity of the observed overall effect, which is of particular importance when trying to extrapolate the data and apply it in a clinical setting to an individual patient. The results of this review were then reproduced by TCGA and then nicely reproduced in our gel cohort. So we feel that this is reassuring and a reproducible finding, but comparing the different types of sequencing um, we felt it raised the question as to what type or level of sequencing is the best to determine the utility of TP53 in a clinical setting. Do we need the least biased and to venture beyond the coding sequence to get the full picture? So what we need is a way to characterize this relationship and outcome in a completely unbiased manner, but critically, it must also address the potential impact of disease site, stage, and HPV status 
to ensure clinical utility and ultimately patient benefit. So all of the previous samples, including our gel cohort, TCJ and the samples included, have an inherent bias towards um, disease that is managed surgically, which is mainly oral cancer. It also has a bias towards higher stage disease. So what we want is in the future to think about an unbiased approach to uh, address these issues. And as a GCEP, we're working towards that and trying to drive the future of this long journey with TP53. So we've, um, we're putting in place a TP53 prospective cohort where we aim to recruit 1,000 to 1,500 patients. Um, and this is a, uh, initially using the National Genomic Test Directory. So to be able to use the, the TP53 sequencing in that, but we're also working and um, trying to make arrangements with industry partners to cover the cost for whole genome sequencing. And that's not only allowing us to validate the National Genomic Test Directory, but also to see whether the sort of beyond the coding region is an important consideration. And of course, um, fingers crossed, funding and everything is successful, which we'll push for. Um, all of that whole genome sequencing data will be available through GEL and will represent the largest cohort worldwide. So just to wrap up and to have a, you know, maybe impart some of our optimism, we feel that the UK head and neck genomic scene for the next five years is looking positive. In addition to the further work we're doing in the current um, 372, I believe, samples in gel. Uh, we already have funding for two other uh, trials that will be um, sequencing samples that will also be entering the gel environment. Uh, we hope to get going with the TP53 prospective trial soon, but the head and neck GCIP are also involved in an individualized therapeutic vaccine for head and neck cancer, and my particular work in the near future is looking at the pre-cancer scene and trying to use genomics to predict malignant transformation. So to leave you with a, uh, a sort of old cultural reference that might show my age, there's more that sort of meets the eye than TP53. And I hope I've shown you some of the work we're doing and how we're trying to direct that in the future. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Shelley. That was a great presentation. I'll, uh wait until we have some more um, questions running into the chat. Um, I, uh, I have questions of my own there. So um, was, do you see, uh, we, we've kind of talked about it a little bit in terms of um, the, the, the spread of head and neck cancer um, in different populations um, due to environmental uh, impact. Do you see this within the Genomics England cohort? Do you see that like some populations express these mutations more than others? So we're, um, obviously our samples come from England, so they're mainly uh, uh, sort of what you expect to see in the sort of the, the Western world. Uh, yeah, like the other etiological factors like uh, pan or beta nut chewing, whilst we do have some in the UK, um, we wouldn't have um, enough numbers or enough uh, clinical annotation to be able to pull that out. But what we can see a very big difference in is um, HPV status. So um, we have a lot of samples with HPV and the uh, sort of co-occurrence of HPV and TP53 mutation is very low. Yeah, okay, that's interesting. Um, we also have a question from uh, anonymous attendee now um, that I'll raise. Um, is the ultimate aim that you use TP53 for prognostication or as a predictive biomarker you, you can use as a response to treatment? Yeah, so uh, I think that's a really good question. Um, and I, essentially, it's uh, to, to look at it through the prospective cohort will be able to give us a bit more insight into what type of to sort of um, marker type it is, be it prognostic or predictive. But the likelihood is that it's more like, well, we're looking more for a prognosticator because to be certain about a predictive, i.e. a response to treatment, it would require two different arms where they're receiving different treatments or um, some 
sort of a way of changing current practice, whereas that's not the aim of the prospective cohort. So there'll be no alteration to current management. Whether or not that then feeds into further clinical trials in the future, then that's something to look at. But it's more likely that we're going to find a prognostic, find it as a prognostic marker. Thank you for that. Okay, and we have another question from um, Deborah Morris Rosenthal, who's asking, um, how did you how did you assess non-coding TP3 variants for pathogenicity? Uh, i.e. what tools you use and what was the molecular mechanism for those identified mostly to affect splicing? So the our work looking at the non-coding region was was is has is still very early. It was just identifying non-coding mutations in TP53, then looking at um looking at the sort of uh, survival in those patients. Obviously, as I mentioned, the numbers were too small. And there's, there's a lot of confounders that could have contributed to that. It was just thinking about, uh, do we need to look at the bigger picture? Um, but they're all very important things that I'll take back to the GSIP. But I, it, the point was just to say, are we, gonna, are we missing anything by ignoring the non-coding regions? We haven't actually uh, defined pathogenicity or anything using those mutations yet. OK. Um, and uh, we have time for um, Deborah says thank you. Uh, we have time for another question, I think, um, from Valeria Lascano. Have you considered looking at MDM2 activity as a proxy for TP53? It, it, I, I was uh, having a conversation about this with people in my lab, where I mean, in Cambridge, and also people in the GSIP. I think. Um, yeah, looking at upstream sort of proteins and, and seeing uh, their expression as, as a surrogate for TP53 mutation is, is good. Um, and it's, I'm sure it's something that experimentally can be explored. But um, the, so yes, we have thought about it, but our aim is more to use existing um, tests that can be available to the, to the patient at this current stage. Okay, great. Um, I think we'll, we can move on to our, our second round of, um, so, of talk now. Um, thank you very much, Shadi, again. Um, Shadi will be uh, still in, in this Zoom meeting, so if you have any more questions, please feel free to put some in the Q&A, and hopefully Shadi can get back to you. Um, uh, now, it brings me to introduce um, uh, Professor Louise Jones, Professor Claude Shalala. Um, these are two experts in breast cancer pathology and uh, translational bioinformatics, um, and they work together on various projects, including the Breast Cancer Now Tissue Bank, Bart's Life Sciences Precision Medicine Program, EU Optima, and the Bart's Precision Medicine BRC Cancer Theme, uh, with which General Mix England are partners. Um, now I'll hand over to you guys to share your slides. Thanks very much, Sam. Okay, so oh, I can't see that properly. Let me just. Okay, um, well, thanks everyone for um, inviting us to talk to you today. Um, we're gonna do a double act. I'm going to kick off and then hand over to Claude. As Sam said, uh, Claude and I have worked together for many years now. Um, we're both based at the Barts Cancer Institute. Um, and just one of the projects that we work on is the um, biobanking. Um, so if I have next slide, please, Claude. Uh, I've been involved in biobanking for, oh gosh, as long as I can remember actually, and I have seen it change dramatically over the years. Um, it's become far more complex, much more bespoke. I think our requirements of data is, is way more sophisticated. Um, but I think one of the things that I'm convinced about is the value of a good quality, well annotated um, sample and data repository for research. And through our links with um, Genomics England and also with the Genomic Medicine Service, we also, I believe, are um, giving advantages to our participants. So we're involved in a number of different 
kinds of studies, we support longitudinal studies, specimens over time, and we're very keen on promoting data sharing and collaborations. Next slide, Claude. And anybody who has worked with the NHS will know the complexity at, in which data is held. Um, there are multiple different systems working within a given trust, and of course, between trusts, even more diverse. So one of our um, primary aims was to really bring together information about the patient, about their treatment, about their comorbidities, together with imaging, uh, histology, samples, blood, and increasingly omic data. So to create this unified research platform, which certainly reduces duplication of effort, but also it really maximizes the research output and provides a very uh, user-friendly way in which to retrieve all the relevant data that links with different samples. And we're gonna talk, Claude in particular, will talk uh, more about the work that she's been doing to really create a data rich environment. Next slide. So just to tell you a little bit about the Breast Cancer Now Tissue Bank, it's uh, a national tissue bank. Um, we have a huge collection of samples, around 50,000 samples from around 11,000 patients. And it's gone through a number of iterations um, in its first um, incarnation. It comprises Leeds, Nottingham, Dundee, um, and ourselves. And then a second iteration involved Southampton, and where we currently are now is with Sheffield, Aberdeen, and Norwich. But the operational centre is based here at the Barts Cancer Institute. So we have specimens from our legacy sites, and ongoing collections from our current um, collaborative sites, but all the management of the samples and of requests comes through the Barts Cancer Institute. And I think that that's much, a much more efficient way of working. Next slide. So I just want to tell you a little bit about what kind of samples we have. So I should have said that at the beginning, I'm a pathologist, um, all of the breast Surgery for Barts Health NHS Trust is currently done at Barts Hospital, which many of you will know is about five minutes away from the Barts Cancer Institute. And that's a huge advantage for us as a biobank because it means that we have ready access to tissue as soon as it comes out of the patient. Um, this means that we take a huge range of different kinds of samples from our, our tissues, including fresh frozen, of course, formalin fixed paraffin embedded tissues, which we can process onto tissue microarrays. We take blood, DNA, RNA. I'm also very proud of our what we call our cell bank because we take live tissue and we can culture these, we can isolate different cell populations, and we have a bank of that viable tissue that can be used in functional assays. And then the type of patient that we're collecting samples from is the full gamut. We have normal breast tissue from uh, cosmetic reduction mammoplasties. We have prophylactic mastectomies from high-risk patients. So for example, BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutated patients, contralateral tissue in women who've already had um, their breast cancer moved from one breast. Uh, I have a particular interest in pre-invasive ductal carcinoma in situ. So we collect tissue from those samples, as well as um, non-involved tissue taken more than five centimeters away from the diseased area. Of course, we take invasive cancers and we have a policy of trying to sample non-involved tissue adjacent to the tumor, which is less than two centimeters from the tumor edge, as well as what we call surround, greater than five centimeters. And we've been, Claude and I, in a, in a separate project, um, have been working on looking at this concept of field cancerization. So taking the tumor, but also looking at the apparently morphologically normal tissue adjacent to it and identifying alterations in that. And of course, as well as our um, prophylactic mastectomies, we're also um, keen to be collecting from BRCA and other um, germline inherited cancers. Next slide. 
We have cohorts within the bank of longitudinal blood samples, and this is a schematic. This is one of our um, collaborators in Sheffield, where they, they'd start taking blood samples at the time of surgery, and then take this post-operatively and throughout the management of the patient, right through to any relapse or metastasis. Um, and of course, that can be um, prepped for circulating DNA or for circulating tumor cells, as well as you know, other, other proteins. Next slide. One of the things that I wanted to talk to you about or just flag to you is that, um, as Sam said in the introduction, you know, we do have a collaboration with Genomics England, and I might know some of you, I've worked with Genomics England for quite some years. Um, and that's allowed us to do a number of things that otherwise might not be possible. And recently, we got um, funding from NIHR to fund uh, our BRC, which is a precision cancer medicine theme, which um, I co-lead. And through this, we aim to build on our collaboration with Genomics England, as well as the Genomic Medicine Service. So... Some of you, I'm sure, will know that um, yes, England commissioned whole genome sequencing for patients with triple negative breast cancer. And as you all know, of course, currently um, fresh frozen tissue is mandatory for uh, whole genome sequencing through, through the system that um, Genomics England supports. So it's been challenging setting this up. And you know, I've set it up in Bart, but also I help people around throughout England to try and set up their pathways. And we've now started to routinely consent our patients who have triple negative breast cancer. Um, one of the complications, but also opportunities, is that many, in fact, most women with triple negative breast cancer will have neoadjuvant chemotherapy. That means they'll have their um, chemotherapy before they have surgery. And so we've set up a pathway whereby these patients come back and they will have a metal clip placed within their tumor so that if they have a full response to chemotherapy, the surgeon has a guide to know where to cut uh, at the time of, of post-treatment surgery. But that allows us also to take that opportunity to take a fresh frozen biopsy which we submit for whole genome sequencing. We also have access to their diagnostic FFPE tissue. And at that stage, we're also taking blood for ctDNA analysis. So these patients will have neoadjuvant chemo and some will ha also have um, an immune checkpoint inhibitor. All patients who have neoadjuvant come to surgery. Okay, that is standard practice. And what we will be doing here is collecting that specimen fresh from surgical excision, again, taking fresh frozen tissue for whole genome sequencing. I think this is going to be particularly interesting to compare the residual, clearly resistant tumour with um, our pre-treatment tumour. And again, we will be taking blood for ctDNA at that point. Some patients will go on to have adjuvant treatment or will go on to have routine follow-up, throughout which we will be taking uh, blood samples when they come to clinic. And then, of course, we will be following these patients. And unfortunately, patients with triple negative breast cancer do relapse. And at that point, we will be going on then to take further biopsies for whole genome sequencing, FFPE tissue and circulating tumor DNA. So I'm quite excited about this prospective project, which really should allow us to get some insight onto how triple negative breast cancer becomes resistant and relapses and, you know, working closely with Genomics England on that. Next slide. The other thing I just wanted to flag and something that um, <laughs> I very much hope we're going to work with Genomics England on is the Cancer Research UK Grand Challenge. So for those of you who are not familiar with these, the Grand Challenge is a large, major research question and Cancer Research UK will fund around four of these every year to the tune of about 20 million each. So they're multi, they're multi center projects. And one of the projects that they announced recently was cancer inequity. So they're 
call is to understand the mechanisms through which genetics, biology, and social determinants affect cancer risk and outcomes in a diverse population. Uh, and of course, you all know that you have an interest in diverse data, um, and I've been talking to your diverse data team, and I very much hope that we're going to be partners in our application for this. We've already started to put together um, a multi-center research team, um, which the deadline for this, for the expression of interest is in June. So, so that's pretty exciting. Next slide, please. So I hope what you can see is that we're really creating an ecosystem for personalized medicine. It's very bespoke. It interlinks the clinical data, molecular data, and in silico resource, which Claude will outline to you, um, together with our samples, together with cells that can be used for functional um, experimental work. And the next slide. So we bring together very rich data to compare with our tissue samples, imaging, and you'll see, as Claude will explain, how um, you can go in to interrogate the bank, link this through to the analytics that have already been done in the background, and then when you find what you're interested in, to put in an application to us. So, um, you know, I was alerted to the Genomics England Diverse Data Programme by an application to our bank. Uh, and that's kind of translated into what I hope is going to be a really um, rich collaboration. And I'm going to hand over to Claude now, to, who will tell you a lot more about the data side, which I think would be of interest to you, Going. Thank you, Louise. Um, so I will just outline to you in the next few slides the data systems that we have set up for the Breast Cancer Now Tissue Bank. Um, so I will just mention on this slide that our applications, uh, the Sample Finder and the Analytics Hub, um, which I will present in the next slide, are web-based. So they are very easy to use for researchers wanting to access tissues and data from the bank, but also wanting to query the data that we have accumulated from uh, publicly relevant projects, but also on samples that have been used in sequencing projects from the biobank. Um, so this is the infrastructure for our data management systems. Um, in yellow here, you could see that we have, um, sorry, let me just think. Um, in yellow, you could see our analytics hub and sample finder web-based applications allowing researchers to query and analyze the samples. Uh, in blue, we have our REDCap uh, clinical data infrastructure that has frameworks for the expression of interest and the application for tissues from researchers, plus all the framework involved in reviewing those applications and making a decision. We do also have a, a data entry system for our collection officers to enter clinical and sample data. And this framework as well interacts with electronic healthcare records, mainly for the BCI uh, site, working with our BART's Health NHS Trust, but also for molecular data. For example, the sequences that are available on BCN TB samples, for example, from Genomics England or other sequencing projects using our samples. And at the bottom here, you can see all the framework for the sample preparation, the release, um, and the return and disposal of samples. So we do have an infrastructure that is highly efficient to allow unified uh, research and facilitate um, usage from different um, um, researchers, uh, tissue bank uh, officers, uh, auditors, but also uh, bioinformaticians and health data scientists. So first I will start by exploring very briefly the analytics and the sample finder. As I said, they are web-based. Um, we believe the sample finder is uh, an important uh, interface, if you want, for the biobank, because it allows researchers to define using clitor, uh, clinical criteria, the research questions and the samples that are suitable for their research project. So they can select from clinical attributes that are relevant for breast cancer. So the gender, ethnicity, menopausal status, survival, receptor status, cancer type, grade and therapy. And when they are ready, they hit the search button and they can view the report, um, download the cohorts or apply for those samples. So if you go to viewing the report, you will be faced with an interactive page that shows very nice graphics representing the summary of the donor statistics. And very important feature is the related data and sources and tools that are available in the analytics hub. 
The relationship is bi-directional. You can start with the sample finder, query our collection and go to the analytics hub, or you can start from the analytics hub and go to apply for samples and query the sample and clinical collection. Uh, we do have information, for example, from TCGA, Genomics England, and Sequencing Project. This is the project that Louise mentioned around the field cancerization, which used uh, RNA sequencing and proteomics on samples from the tissue bank. So if you go to the analytics or the bioinformatics portal, you could explore our research catalog, so our research project and publications that were uh, produced using samples from the biobank. You can search our analytics hub, so you can ask very specific query to large scale publicly available projects and data from our BCN TB projects as well. Or you could apply for samples and go back to the sample finder. We have published the previous releases of the bioinformatics portal, uh, and we are currently preparing a manuscript describing this latest release. Our research catalog is very important. It allows us to monitor the publications, the PhD project, and any activities of leverage funding uh, that was uh, facilitated, if you want, by usage of the BCN TB. Data entry can be um, entered directly by researchers You're using our online form. Um, the Analytics Hub is a very nice feature uh, because scientists don't need a bioinformatician to query uh, breast cancer collections from the TCGA, the ICGC, or the Cancer Cell Line Encyclopedia, or from BCN TB data used, for example, in Genomics England or other sequencing. Uh, project. Now again, I go back to the filtering stage, which I think is very important. So if you select a data to query, and I think in this example I'm using the TCGA, you can introduce um, clinical features. So you can introduce very relevant breast cancer criteria to refine the selection of the cohort before you start the exploration of the clinical and molecular attributes. And you can use and or combined criteria from clinical and molecular filters. And once you have selected your filters, you can overview the clinical summary. And this is very useful. Again, it was developed from a breast cancer researcher point of view. So for example, in this figure, you could see the survival time uh, after the diagnosis of breast cancer, and you have the age of diagnosis of breast cancer. So very quickly, you are inspecting the clinical information and all of these features are interactive. You might be interested in the survival time and ethnicity or genetic ancestry and everything is calculated on the fly and very graphically um, uh, for, for graphical exploration. We do also present information about patient and tumor statistics and we present very rich genomics data that is again computed on the fly. So here you have a very nice representation of the top mutated genes, the variant classification, the variant per samples, and um, you can produce as well oncoplots and other genomic explorations will be available uh, through the analytics hub. Um, the cohort comparison is a new fe feature that I think is very relevant because the data that is at the back end of the analytics hub is structured. You could query based on age of diagnosis. For example, we perform the classification based on age under 40, 40 to 59 and over 60 on genetic ancestry, on menopausal status, on receptor status. And clinical samples from the projects that we have in the analytics hub that have included this clinical criteria would be available for you to explore. So this is a quick meta-analysis that would be available through the analytics hub on the fly in a few seconds. You will be able to explore those questions or those clinical attributes in large publicly available data sets or data that was returned to the BCN TB. Um, we have also um, a contact page. We are very keen to hear from the research community asking questions or interested in depositing their data or asking for new features that would be relevant for breast cancer research. Now, I want to go back to the paper um, that we published recently on dynamic biobanking for advancing breast cancer research. And I want to show you the power of having molecular data and electronic healthcare records linked to a biobanking system. So the Breast Cancer Now Tissue Bank at the BCI uh, has various linked data sources. We work very closely with our Bart's Health NHS Trust, and we obtain data extracts that are structured and free text uh, on different uh, clinical uh, va valuable data sets. So for example, the pharmacy stock, demographics, diagnosis, procedures, pathology. 
We do also have our biobank data, and this is very rich data because it's explicitly extracted from the electronic healthcare records from interviews with patients for breast cancer research. So it's very well annotated and it's very useful um, when it's linked to the hospital data. So we collect information about follow-up, survival, diagnosis, a lot of information about the medical history, lifestyle. And we also link to molecular data available from large sequencing projects. And mainly those are whole genome sequencing and RNA-seq, working with Genomics England, but also other projects that have used samples from the Breast Cancer Now Tissue Bank. So I will show you in the next few slides how we were able to connect clinical records longitudinal clinical records to explore clinical and genomics data for uh, predictive modeling and decision making. First, I want to focus on individual patients. So we focused on uh, one patient that I will show you in the next few slides, and we tried to build patient journeys using our various data sources. So the EHR, the biobank, um, also imaging free text reports, and also whole genome sequencing data. And we will show how this would enable and facilitate actionable precision medicine. So this is the patient journey from our biobanking data. As I said, it's been collected with breast cancer, uh, from a breast cancer researcher point of view. Um, we can, we uh, record the age at diagnosis, we record the ethnicity, we record a lot of the medical history of the patient. We record information about the medication that they are on. We also record information about the treatment that they are having and also the side effect. And when we record the date of death, we often record the cause of death as well. Uh, and you could see that this is uh, along a follow-up period of five years of this patient. Now I'm going to use the same patient and I'm going to show you how the electronic healthcare record from the hospital looks like. So as you see, the data is structured. Um, the age at diagnosis is not um, a feature that we can extract. We have to calculate this based on the date of birth of the patient and the date of diagnosis of a breast cancer. Um, this data is very valuable for uh, investigating, for example, comorbidities because it's very well structured. Uh, but this data doesn't cover, for example, the side effect that a patient will have from a treatment. These are often recorded in free text format. Um, and most often the, the cause of death is not recorded. Um, and finally, for the, same, for the same patient, from the clinical point of view, we are looking here at imaging data. So you could see here on this slide, it's the same patient that has undergone many imaging modalities at the hospital. So we have mammograms, we have x-rays, we have CT scans. And you could see that the natural language processing on free text reports has highlighted um, uh, features that are important if we are looking into, uh, for example, the recurrences. The point of this, and this is what uh, we are working on, and the manuscript is at the moment in preparation, is that we want to look at these records and we want to integrate this with the structured data from the biobank and from the hospital to see if we can highlight earlier a possible recurrence event. So at the moment, we are looking into over 45,000 imaging reports for our whole cohort in the BCN-TB. And most importantly, I'm a bioinformatician by training, is how do we extract meaningful information from whole genome sequencing to include in the patient clinical data and facilitate clinical management. So you could see here that this patient has sequencing data available from Genomics England. So what we did here, we looked at the somatic mutations and we asked the question whether they are biomarkers for drug response. The data that I'm presenting here is an exact match um, with uh, the CGI database that indicate uh, biomarkers for drug response. And you could see very quickly that you can visually inspect those mutations and you can record whether they uh, contribute to a response or a resistant to a given drug. And we have started very recently a collaboration with Snowmad CT, which I'm really excited about, to help code this information into the clinical ontologies. And I think this would be very exciting if we can add this to the clinical records of the patient to facilitate treatment management. Now, because we have everything structured, it's possible for us to do a cohort analysis. 
So in this study, in the paper that we have published, we looked at 1,066 patients that had follow-up data for at least five years or until death, whichever was earlier event. We looked at those patients that had age of diagnosis, ethnicity, disease, and survival status data available, but also most importantly, independently verified. So we verified all those records. And what we did, we did a very quick overview of the breast cancer landscape and we asked specific questions. We wanted to see the evolution of disease status in this cohort. We wanted to look at the co-occurrence of comorbidities, but also at the age of diagnosis of the primary cancer and the ethnic group. The breast cancer now tissue bank at the BCI, biobanks from Northeast London, which is an ethnic diverse community. And this type of, of analysis is very important to inform the breast cancer landscape in our community. So um, very briefly, you could see here that we looked for all our donors, the 1,066 patients. We have the presentation, but also over the five years, we looked at the primary cancer at presentation or de novo metastasis at presentation. But we also followed up those, pa those patients to see whether they have a recurrence event um, or whether they were had a death event and you could see here over the years that we are able to catalog those we're able to inspect the events that are occurring but most importantly we can add valuable information that would facilitate research question into recurrence and into survival we looked also at the co-occurrence of, comor of morbidities with a breast cancer diagnosis so we noticed for example here that cardiovascular disease hypertension and diabetes are the most prevalent uh, comorbidities with breast cancer. I have to say that this data is from the hospital and will greatly improve with the hopefully the new extract that we will be getting from the discovery project from primary care data. Age at diagnosis and ethnicity is something else we looked at. So we'd record age at diagnosis and we have the self-reported ethnicity of our patients. And you could see here very quickly that in our ethnic group, the age at diagnosis is much uh, early on than the counterpart white group. So I would like to end by saying, at what point in your research you, would, you could use the BCNTB data systems? I would say in the planning phase, I would encourage you to look at the sample finder if you are preparing or planning a breast cancer research project. So you could look at our collection and you could see with, with whether we have the clinical data that you're interested in. Um, you could explore and analyze the available data from publicly uh, available projects, but also from data that has been returned to the biobank. You could look into using our systems when you are uh, starting your project, submit an expression of interest or a request. But also you can investigate your data with ongoing results. You could query our analytics hub and make sure, it, well, look at the overlap between your ongoing results and publicly available results. And also in the validation, you can't possibly publish now without validating on TCGA or other large publicly available data sets. And this is something you could do very quickly using our analytics hub. Um, and if you use samples from the BCNTB, we will be contacting you and encouraging you to submit to our research catalog. Now I have to say none of this work is possible without the individuals who have donated to the Breast Cancer Now, for whom we are very grateful. Uh, we are grateful for the support of the Breast Cancer Now charity and um, other charities that have funded several aspects of this work um, and the Breast Cancer Now Tissue Bank team, uh, amazing team that actually are de very dedicated um, to ensuring that researchers get the best samples and data and all our BCNTB sites. And I'll stop here and thank you very much for listening. Well, thank you very much, uh, Claude and Louise, for that presentation. That was fantastic. Um, it's like you've got a very robust resource here. We have a couple of questions in the chat, which I think we should try and get to uh, before everyone leaves, because uh, we're at time now. Um, there's one from an anonymous attendee who asks, uh, are all breast cancer now tissue bank sites collecting and linking data sources like you've shown today? Um, I would say that um, I will, I'll let Louise talk about the samples, but I would like to say that uh, for the electronic healthcare records and the linkage to the hospitals, it's a know-how that we are developing with Bart's Health NHS Trust for patients that have been consented at Bart's, uh, at the BCI site of the BCNTB. 
And it's something that we would like other sites to replicate, but we are not there yet. Um, so it's mainly the data that we have for uh, the patients at uh, BCI. Um, do you want to talk about the samples, Louise? Yeah, just the other very briefly, um, the sites were chosen because of um, what they could bring specifically. So, for example, we're working with Norwich because they have a big interest in microbiome. Um, and obviously we collect tissues as well, but we're also collecting microbiome uh, samples from there. Um, we work with Sheffield because they have a big interest in longitudinal bloods. So, yes, the short answer is they are collecting. Um, possibly not quite the breadth that we collect here, um, but everyone is collecting. Yeah. Excellent. OK, uh, well, we're at time here, so I'm just going to say um, thank you so much to all of our speakers uh, and for all of our participants who joined. Um, we will capture any questions that are still uh, open in the chat and make sure that the speakers get back to you. Um, and uh, please register for the Genomic Signal Research Summit if, you, uh, uh, if you're interested in that as well. It'll be an in-person event held in London. Um, uh, the details will be available if you just Google them, um, and we'll send out emails and stuff about it in the future. But thanks, everyone, for joining. Uh, good afternoon. Have a good afternoon.